again on the next uh, part of the lectures. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the um, getting to play with uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, there were a few of you found bugs, so thanks for pointing them out. Uh, if you have any others, then uh, please let me know about them. Uh, and if you do ask uh, questions um, that I think other people would also be interested to hear the answer to. Uh, so one question was, uh, why is it called the cross-entropy method? It, uh, it doesn't seem to have cross-entropy anywhere in it. Uh, the reason is that this algorithm has a sort of convoluted history where originally um, there was this algorithm that was used for um, estimating integrals using important sampling. And uh, in this, uh, this algorithm worked by um, collecting, well, it tried to minimize the sort of cross entropy. And um, then this algorithm for integral estimation was adapted to the setting of global optimization and kept its name. So, so that's uh, the historical reason for it. Um, OK, discount factor that I mentioned in the lecture. Don't worry about that for now. Um, OK, so some of you tried um, the environments other than particle and found that they didn't work. Um, and uh, what, what, or at least uh, the implementation didn't solve them. Uh, so for example, there is this map car environment where you're trying to get this car to drive to the top of the hill. And um, the reason that wasn't working is, is that uh, you were getting a reward of zero every time. Uh, so you're obviously not going to learn anything if uh, you're never getting any kind of signal. Um, so, what I would recommend uh, to try to make that work is to use a, uh, well, there are two possibilities. Uh, one is maybe uh, there's just no linear policy or no affine policy that solves the problem. So, you can use a neural network policy. That's one possibility. The other is to use a stochastic policy uh, because um, sometimes uh, if you just use random, uh, totally random controls, sometimes you randomly uh, solve the problem and get the card at the top of the hill. So, um, actually, I would recommend this in, uh, as a general um, debugging tip in reinforcement learning is just uh, look at what the random policy does. And, and, and that means just uniformly randomly uh, sample from the action space and see how often it succeeds. And if you're never succeeding with the random policy, then you probably need to do some kind of exploration, uh, which, which is basically, that means you're actively trying to uh, you're actually actively trying out different things and forcing the algorithm to uh, try to reach different kinds of states. Let's see. Which were the other environments? There was the uh, pendulum. That one wasn't working either. Uh, so that one might be the neural network. Uh, I know that if all these can be solved using a neural network policy. So if you just use a neural network policy and, and a lot of samples, I think it solves all of them. Uh, if you actually want to see, um, okay, I didn't show you this um, before, but you can go to, um, you can see what, what it looks like. Whoops, okay, I, I have to put in my username and password every time I open the computer, so this isn't going to work. But if you go to gym.openai.com, uh, you can look at what, um, you, you can uh, see other people's uh, policies running on all these environments. So you can see, for example, on the, um, Potentially, uh, you can see uh, a video of some uh, some other algorithm and what it does on that. And and actually, a lot of people have submitted different algorithms, so you can um, so there um, several uh, you can see that several different kinds of algorithms can solve the problem. Okay. Oh yeah, some of you uh, started to look at the problem on entry, uh, the, uh, analyzing cross entropy method. So actually, the um, what I would recommend, my hint here is that uh, you, you can write, um, you want to write down the important sampling estimator for the expected uh, reward, or the expected value of that. So if you write down the important sampling estimator, then you can uh, derive the lower bounds on that estimator. And then uh, if you make an improvement to the lower bound, then you're guaranteed to also make an improvement to the actual expectation that you care about. So that's my, my hint. Okay. Any other questions uh, before I uh, get started on the next part, which is totally different? Oh, 
Okay, so I'm going to get started on the next part, which is policy gradient methods. So, whereas the previous um, part was about using derivative free optimization uh, to optimize policies, this part is going to be about uh, actually estimating the gradients so you can use a gradient based algorithm. Oops. Okay, so, so here's, here's the optimization problem. Uh, we're trying to maximize expected reward. Uh, capital R means the sum of rewards over a whole episode. Um, and this obviously depends on the policy, which we're writing as pi sub theta here. Um, and we're trying to optimize uh, this expectation. We're trying to maximize the expectation with respect to theta, the parameter vector in the policy. Um, so how could we possibly do this? The rough intuition for how policy gradient methods work is as follows. First, we collect a bunch of trajectories by just running our current uh, policy. And uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to try to make the good trajectories more probable and the bad ones less probable. So uh, this is all. This is assuming we're going to we have a stochastic policy. So when you when you run the policy uh, many times, many different things are going to happen. And sometimes the policy is going to get lucky and choose really good actions, and sometimes it's going to get unlucky and choose bad actions. So the way the policy gradient method is going to work in a uh, sort of rough sense is it's going to uh, it's going to take the lucky trajectories or the lucky episodes and try to make those actions more probable. And uh, so then um, that's the crudest possible methods are just going to um, take the good trajectories and try to make them more probable. Then there are going to be some more refined policy gradient methods which actually uh, try to figure out which actions were good and which actions were bad and try to make the good actions more probable. And um, then there's an, another set of methods uh, which actually um, directly try to push the actions towards the good, um, towards better actions. So, um, the, I mean, the later lectures are going to talk about these more sophisticated methods, but uh, yeah, basically this is, um, this is a summary of, um, of the different kinds of policy gradient methods that we're going to talk about. And uh, today we're just going to talk about, um, we're, we're sort of just going to talk about the first point, which is methods that are kind of crude, I mean, the methods that are kind of crude and they just try to make the good trajectories more probable. Okay, so, uh, so the basic, the core idea we're going to use to derive policy gradient methods is um, this uh, so-called score function gradient estimator. Um, so this is actually really generic and uh, doesn't, I mean, this, uh, we don't have to be in the, R, uh, the reinforcement learning setting to use this. So this um, is going to apply to any kind of parameterized probability distribution. Uh, so, so the setup is we've got some expectation, um, expectation of f of x, where x is sampled from some uh, probability distribution, that, uh, p, that depends on a parameter theta. And we're trying to compute the gradient of this expectation with respect to theta. And it's not totally obvious how to do this because our parameter appears in the distribution. So uh, the way we can uh, derive the, um, the group. OK, so we want to basically compute this gradient estimate um, by just sampling uh, from the distribution, by uh, some kind of sampling scheme. That's what we're going to try to do. So all we're, allowed to, all we're going to be allowed to do is collect samples of values in x, and then we want to um, somehow compute this gradient, uh, an estimator of this gradient uh, right here. So this is what we want to compute. And all we're allowed to do is take samples of x. Uh, so this is, a, I mean, we're not assuming that we know anything about the function f. That's the key thing here. So, so we, can, um, we can try to derive this estimator by uh, first writing the expectation as an integral. Uh, so. Uh, Write it as an integral, then um, if the integrand is uh, differentiable with respect to theta, then we can swap the derivative and the integral. Uh, so now we've got it inside. Um, so now if we look at this integral, um, it's not an expectation, because the only way it's going to be an expectation is if we have something that looks like integral dx times probability of x. So that's, we want this to be a, 
uh, derivative, we want this to be an um, integration against some kind of probability measure. So what we're going to do is just integrate any introduce the probability measure here. We're just going to multiply by the probability that's in here. But since we multiply it uh, by it there, we need to divide by it. So now, uh, so, and then using the chain rule, we can rewrite this uh, fraction as gradient of log probability. Uh, and then now uh, we're in good shape because this is an expectation. This last integral is an expectation. So then we can write it as um, this expectation over x of um, the function value times grad log probability. Okay, so and, and this so this this is an unbiased uh, gradient estimator, which we can uh, we can obtain an unbiased gradient estimator as follows. Uh, first, we collect one sample x sub i from our probability density, and then we can compute the uh, we can compute the gradient estimate, which we're going to call g hat, as um, just the function value times the grad log probability. And it's unbiased, meaning that when we take the expectation, we um, get the uh, we get the gradient uh, that we're looking for. Oops. Uh, so what do we what do we need to know about our problem to be able to compute this gradient estimator? We just need to be able to compute. Well, we just need to be able to differentiate uh, the probability density. So that's all we know. We don't need to know anything about f. That's the important thing. We need to know what p is, but we don't need to know f. So now we know how to compute the gradient of this expectation. Um, there's also another nice derivation uh, that's also worth knowing about. Um, I'm going to give talk about this score function gradient estimator a lot because even though it's extremely simple, it's also very important. And uh, basically, the whole policy—I mean, all this policy gradient, um, this, this whole theory is just based on applying this score function gradient estimator uh, many times. So it's important to have various perspectives on it. So here we, we can derive it in an alternative way without ever um, without ever resorting to looking at integrals by uh, using important sampling. Uh, so so here's what um, here's our expectation, and we can write down um, we can take a fixed value of the a fixed parameter vector and um, write down an estimator that just uses samples from that uh, fixed parameter. So here's, uh, here's our important sampling estimator. Um, so the way you can interpret this uh, expression is it's saying um, we have a bunch of samples from theta old. And um, now we can uh, do a sort of what if estimate of uh, what would the expectation of f be if we had some other parameter vector theta. So anyway, uh, here's our important sampling estimator. Uh, so now we can differentiate it. Um, and now, since uh, the parameter theta doesn't appear in the um, distribution anymore, now all we have to do, uh, all we have to do, is exchange the gradient and the expectation, which is uh, valid as long as the uh, term inside the expectation is differentiable with respect to theta. So, by doing this important sampling estimator and getting the parameter theta out of the expectation, now we make it possible to just exchange the gradient and the expectation. So anyway, uh, continuing, we end up with this same estimate. And here I've been a little more careful about uh, talking about whether uh, about gradient expressions and where they're evaluated. Okay, so so here's our um, estimator, and what's the intuition before and behind it? Uh, so let's say f of x is measuring how good the sample x is, uh, then. Um, we get, I mean, when we take the sample x and we get this gradient estimator, then uh, moving in that direction um, pushes up the log probability of that sample. So we're pushing up the pro log probability of a given sample in proportion to how good it is. So it's clear that um, that, that direction in uh, parameter space is going to move towards uh, the good samples, right? Because we're just pushing up the probability of the really good ones. And um, Okay, so here's, uh, so this is really, um, I mean, it's, it's a really simple derivation, obviously, it's pretty trivial, but uh, it's, it's actually, a, um, the fact that you can uh, obtain this estimator is actually um, kind of surprising because, uh, because we, it works even if the function f of x is discontinuous. 
Uh, so, I mean, I'm not even saying non-differential, I'm saying uh, discontinuous. And in fact, um, it's okay if the x is just a discrete random variable. It's not even a continuous random variable. So, um, so this is extremely flexible. And actually people, th so this lets you um, optimize sort of non-expectations of some non-differentiable function, which is kind of surprising. Uh, so, if you like, um, if you, I personally like uh, these kind of physical intuitions of what's going on. Um, so, so there's a nice uh, physical intuition you can use to understand this gradient estimator. Uh, so, um, uh, so here, uh, what you can do is, um, here we've got the probability dis uh, density, uh, p of x, drawn as this black curve, and then the function is drawn as this uh, red curve here. And um, you can see that um, the, oh, and let's imagine that uh, the parameter theta um, adjusts the mean of our distribution, P of x. So, so that means that this uh, sort of parabola shape, this uh, curve P of x, is free to slide to the left and to the right um, as we adjust theta. So, um, so now let's say we've got a bunch of samples of x. Um, so we should, our score function estimator should try to slide this distribution to the right um, when we're um, moving in the gradient direction that'll maximize uh, the expectation of f of x. Because f of x is higher to the right. So um, our gradient estimator should slide the distribution to the right. What you can imagine is um, this probability uh, density is like uh, some kind of uh, metal sheet. And, uh, each of these samples is like a little force pushing on that metal sheet. Um, and uh, you can see that the forces are higher on the right, the forces like on the right side, it's, it, um, it's being pushed strongly and it's being pushed weakly on the left side. Um, meaning that um, the samples that you get on the um, left side of that distribution, um, you're pushing up the probability density weakly there whereas you're pushing it up strongly on the right. So, so it's clear that this sheet should move over to the right. The, force, the net force should move it over to the right. So, and that's, in, um, so that's, that's a physical intuition for what this, uh, this gradient estimator is doing. It's like each time you get a sample, it's like a little force or a little impulse uh, pushing on the probability density, uh, trying to push it upwards at that point. And, uh, Does this make sense? Okay, so that's that's just a lot of intuition for the score function gradient estimator. So now, um, for policy gradients, um, we're just going to apply this exact, um, just this this estimator um, to, and we're we're just going to apply this exact idea, except we're going to just use the probability of. Um, we're just going to consider the stochastic process that uh, generates uh, trajectories. So here, um, our random variable x that we were using before is going to uh, denote a whole trajectory, um, where a trajectory means um, a sequence of states, actions, and rewards um, that keeps on going until you reach a terminal state. So this is just, um, you just keep applying the policy um, and keep sampling uh, next states and next actions until you get to the terminal state, and that's, that's the trajectory. So um, now we want to calculate expectation over trajectories of the reward, and we want to compute the gradient of that with respect to the uh, parameter of the policy, which is theta. So using the formula we derived previously, uh, that's going to just be expectation over trajectories of grad log probability of the trajectory times reward of the trajectory. Now we just need to write out the, uh, the probability of the trajectory, and then we're in good shape. So we just need to multiply together all the probabilities um, from this process that generates the trajectory. So we have the initial state, we have to sample the initial state from this initial state distribution, and then uh, for each time step, we sample an action, and then we sample the next state, and then reward. Um, so we actually care about the log probability, so now we take the log, and now our product turns into a big sum. And now, um, here's the magical part, 
And here's why the policy gradient, we can compute a policy gradient even though we don't know anything about um, the probability distribution of P. So the, the nice thing that happens is all of the terms that don't get seen theta just drop out here. So now we just get uh, grand log probability of the trajectory just depends on the grand log probability of actions. And uh, so there's our estimator. Uh, grand log probability of expected reward is just the expectation of the total, I mean, this is total reward times uh, the uh, sum of log probabilities of all the actions. So this is actually, um, maybe I've rubbed in, this in enough already, but uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, or it's a little surprising that this is possible, that even though you don't know anything about the, um, the pro uh, process that's used, uh, I mean, you don't know anything about the environment, you can still calculate this gradient. Um, and people are kind of surprised, like people who work in optimal control are usually surprised that it's possible to compute this gradient even if the reward function is non-differentiable or the dynamics are non-differentiable. Because uh, a lot of people are used to, uh, are, are used to just uh, problems where you have, where everything is assumed to be, everything has to be differentiable. Okay, so that's our policy gradient estimator. And uh, the interpretation is that uh, we collect trajectories and uh, some of them have high return and uh, we're, you, we're increasing the log probability of those trajectories with high return. And uh, that, you can sort of think of that as um, saying that we're, we're using our high reward trajectories as uh, supervised examples in the classification or regression problem. So, so in reinforcement learning, it's not like supervised learning because uh, we don't know what are the good, what are the right actions to be taken. Uh, so we have to just do trial and error. And every once in a while we get lucky and then we use those lucky examples as supervision. That's sort of what policy gradient methods are doing. Okay, so, so now we can, uh, so that, okay, so that's, this is a perfectly good policy gradient estimator and now you can go and implement this and uh, use it to optimize policy. Um, the problem is it has really high variance. Um, and that's because it's, uh, well, it's uh, confounding together the effect of all the actions. Like, let's say you had a million actions. Um, it's just increase, and, and then you have a um, reward. Uh, you, you're basically adding together all the rewards of those million actions and just trying to increase the probability of all of those actions equally. You're not making any attempt to figure out which were the good actions. So if you want to, so, so that, um, the way that manifests itself um, is, that means that um, your estimator is unbiased, but it's going to have high variance. So you're going to need tons of samples before you get it, uh, before your estimator is good enough. I mean, before you, your uh, empirical estimate is good enough. So, so now we're going to introduce a bunch of ideas that let you reduce the variance of the policy gradient estimator while uh, keeping it unbiased. So, so we can uh, first derive a slightly better, uh, so, so now we're gonna derive a slightly better formula that um, accounts for causality. Um, so, so what we're gonna do here is um, we're gonna just compute the gradient of the expectation of one reward term, R sub t. Uh, so, so this is, whoops, uh, there should be a gradient sign here. Um, so, so here's, uh, just let's just ignore this uh, gradient symbol here so the equation becomes correct. Uh, so we're looking at the, oh sorry, it is correct, I, I just missed it. Uh, okay, this is correct, sorry. Uh, so here's, uh, here's, we're just applying our regular old score function gradient estimator to one reward term instead of the sum of rewards. And, and notice that um, all of the uh, time steps, um, uh, I mean, notice that we only care about actions that occur before that reward. Because any actions that happen after that reward are not going to, I mean, we don't need to include those when we write down the expectation for that reward. Right, so we're looking at R sub t. We only have to, we can just consider uh, this uh, first part of the trajectory that uh, goes up to time t. And uh, we don't have to look at any of the um, actions after time step t. So, uh, so we get this estimator that just involves actions 
with t prime less than less than or equal to t. Um, okay, so then if we sum that formula over t, uh, we obtain a slightly different and better policy gradient estimator. Uh, so now we have um, we have two equivalent formula. Um, so the first formula says we sum over t and we have the reward at time t times um, the uh, grand log probability of the action at uh, t prime, which is less than or equal to t. So we're multiplying the probability of a given reward times the uh, ground log probability of all the preceding actions. Um, whereas if you look at this formula right here, it's multiplying, if you were to expand out this product, it would involve every product of every time step for the reward times every time step for the action. So this um, formula has half as many terms. And then we can just re reorder the summation. This is exactly the same. So we just reordered the summation, and now it's grand log probability of the action uh, times the sum of all the future rewards. Anyone have a question? I'm sorry. In the inner sum, should we have the small t as an upper index? By the, which sum? The, this one? The, the, the inner one on the, the first line. Yeah. Should this we have small t? As the upper index of the sum? Oh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. Oh, that's a mistake. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Or the same thing? Okay. Okay, so now um, the next modification of this formula um, is, um, is as follows. Okay so, okay, so first I'm going to give a little intuition about why the previous formula is bad, the different reason why it's bad. And, and this is, now we're going to go back to just score function at uh, grading estimation, um, not specific to the reinforcement learning set. So, okay, so let's say we have this function f of x and we're trying to maximize expectation of f of x. And let's say f of x is always positive. Uh, that means that whatever you sample um, x sub i, our gradient estimator is trying to push up the density of that x sub i. Um, okay, so so that seems stupid because uh, what if it's like the minimum value of f of x? What if we get a really, what if it's a really bad sample, x sub i? Then we should push down the density of that sample. So we only want to push up the density of uh, samples that are better than average, assuming that we're trying to maximize that, right? So what we can do is, uh, is, okay, so we can derive an estimator that um, only pushes up the uh, density of better than average samples. Uh, when, I mean, when I say that the estimator is pushing up the density, I mean that when we compute the estimator of grad log, uh, uh, I mean, when we compute the estimator of uh, the gradient of the expected uh, expectation of that, and then we move in that gradient direction, then it's going to push up the probability of certain samples. So I'm saying that if we move in the direction of the gradient estimator, then it's going to push up a certain, certain probabilities. Okay, so we can derive a better estimator. So uh, we can just subtract a constant uh, from our function, and uh, then we can, uh, after applying this, uh, after this, uh, applying this offset, we just write, write out our score function estimator again. Um, and, uh, okay, so what I sh showed right here is that all we, uh, we can just uh, subtract out any kind of constant from f of x, and it's not going to, ex it's not going to affect the, the mean uh, of our grading estimator. Oh, sorry, yeah, this should be log, uh, grad log p. Uh, so the point here is that we can subtract any constant from f of x, and that's not going to affect the uh, expectation. So, um, so what we can do is uh, take uh, b to be expectation of f of x. Uh, and that way, uh, that way, when we move in the gradient direction, we're only pushing up um, the probability of x if f of x was better than the I mean, if f, if f of x was higher than mean, we're going to push down the probability if it was lower than mean. Uh, so, 
Note that we have to estimate B from samples, though. So uh, we don't know B a priori. Uh, so if you collect a bunch of samples and then you use those samples to estimate B, and then you plug that B into the gradient estimator, then there's going to be a little bias in the G. But that's not a big deal. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's how you can apply this idea of a baseline in the setting of score function uh, gradient estimation. Uh, so you can also, um, so now we can just apply the same idea to policy gradient estimation. And uh, recall that here's our policy gradient estimator. And uh, the upper index should be T as before. Okay, so, so here we're going to just use the fact that um, expectation of uh, grad log probability is always going to be zero. Uh, so this is, oops, I said expectation over x, and this is a. Here, this should say uh, expectation over a prime. Uh, so using the fact that this expectation equals zero, uh, we can, uh, oops, let's see. Okay, so here's, um, we can get this expression, uh, which um, we can use this expression as our new estimator, and it, it's also an unbiased estimator of the policy group. Uh, so all we're doing here is we're summing up the rewards and we're subtracting out uh, some uh, kind of function uh, called B, uh, which is not necessarily constant, but might depend on uh, the state. Uh, I'm going to explain this in more detail in a moment. Uh, but anyway, what's happening here is we're increasing the log probability of our action uh, proportional proportionally to how much uh, the returns are better than expected. So I did uh, explain this uh, formula fully. Um, it turns out that you just have to move, it, it's um, a pretty straightforward, um, I mean to prove, okay, the formula that's uh, relevant here is that uh, when we take uh, expectation over trajectories of, uh, we take uh, sum over time, Right. Um, so we're taking the expectation uh, of reward uh, times uh, grad log probability of uh, previous actions. Um, so uh, this was our old estimator for the policy gradient. Um, oh, and the other way of writing this estimator um, is uh, we have uh, we can switch the order of the summation. So now we have uh, we have grad log probability of a, a sub t prime given s sub t prime uh, times sum of future rewards. This should be t minus one. Okay, so this was our old S, this was our old formula. Uh, we had grad log probability of action uh, times sum of uh, future rewards. Uh, so what I'm planning here is that uh, we can uh, subtract out uh, uh, some function of the state um, from this sum. So we can uh, we can subtract out some function baseline b for baseline of s sub t. Well, actually, it should be s sub t prime. And uh, the way you prove that that this is um, doesn't affect the expectation is um, you just uh, you just have to move around uh, move around nested expectations a bit. Uh, so it ends up um, you end up uh, finding that it turns in. I mean you you use the uh, use the law of iterated expectations. So you break up this expectation over trajectories into the part of um, into um, all the terms, all the variables that happened before t prime, and all the variables that happen after t prime, and then you end up, you use the fact that um, expectation over action, uh, action sub uh, t prime of uh, grad theta uh, log probability of uh, action t prime given 
in state t prime beta, uh, this equals zero. So he, I'm just rewriting the stuff that was wrong on the slide. So uh, this expectation equals zero, and using that fact, you can prove that uh, when we subtract out this baseline function, uh, it doesn't affect the uh, expectation. Okay, hopefully that uh, made some sense. Okay, and uh, later um, we're going to uh, we're going to do even better than this by introducing value functions. Uh, so value functions in general are uh, functions that um, estimate the expected uh, return. So we're going to uh, try to further isolate the effect of a given action at the cost of introducing some bias, uh, and this is going to allow us to uh, try to figure out which are the good actions and which are the bad actions, so we can just increase the probability of the good actions. Okay, and uh, and also um, my colleagues and I wrote a paper uh, last year. Oops, that should say uh, 2015, not 2006. Uh, so um, we wrote a paper um, that basically asked the question: uh, What if you have some really complicated dependency graph of random variables, and you're trying to calculate the expectation, uh, the gradient of some expectation? Um, then you can do it. Um, you can just use the graph and uh, and we derive a really generic uh, gradient estimator for this setting. Uh, so instead of, so whereas in this calculation right here, um, we assume that there's this chain graph that's used to generate all the data, um, you could imagine some kind of more complicated uh, structure, some kind of more complicated graphical model where we want to do a score function gradient estimator. So that's what we're doing in the paper. Uh, uh -huh. Although surprised that there's a uh, sorry, what was that? All this requires that there is a reward before the terminal state, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you're saying that this requires, I don't understand the question. A small r of t? Yeah. That is a reward at time t, right? Oh, yeah, yeah correct. So it implies that you have a problem where you can measure reward before you get to the end state. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So uh, it assumes that uh, your objective is a sum of different uh, uh, you're trying to um, com compute the gradient of a, a sum of, uh, I mean, the expectation of a sum of terms, uh, such as uh, rewards. Uh, but they don't have to be rewards. They could be uh, cost terms that you get in, uh, in some other um, kind of probabilistic model. Uh, any other questions? OK, so that's all for today. Uh, so the next class is going to talk much more about uh, policy gradient estimators that involve value functions. So we're going to review this thing uh, and also talk about more uh, fine-grained estimators, uh, but I just wanted to do a little bit of a preview of it today. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about that a lot more tomorrow. Uh, here's the link again. Um, so there's another, uh, there's another set of, uh, of exercises. Oh, I can't show you uh, the, uh, I can't bring up the page, but um, there's another set of best, uh, exercises which are just uh, applying the score function gradient estimator to different distributions. So I, I find it kind of um, illuminating to just look at exactly what the functional form looks like. For example, when you have a Gaussian distribution, uh, what, is it, what does the score function gradient estimator look like? It turns out to look a lot like a finite difference estimator uh, for estimating a gradient. Uh, so, so I just uh, you might want to just go through that at some point. Uh, either um, now or after lunch. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's number three, uh, this uh, number three in the uh, exercises. Um, okay, so that's all. Uh, any other questions?